webinar ID 875-769-803. May we remind attendees that first, your mic should be, should be mute for the rest of the meeting. Second, use the question box mainly in your questions or comments. The questions and answer portion will be held after the lecture and will be facilitated by your moderator, yours truly. The session will run for about an hour with 30 minutes allotted for lecture, followed by reaction and a question and answer portion. May we also remind all the participants that for you to receive your certificates, you must be able to, to fill out the following. For the, the emerging tech pretest, so you can access the pretest using the link bit.ly slash mhtech pretest. Then after the seminar or the webinar, you can access the evaluation form bit.ly slash mhtech eval. And then um, you can also take the you should also take the post test after the webinar bit.ly slash mhtech post test. For questions or problems, you can use the chat box uh, the, at the right side of your screen, or you can also message me if you have questions. My number is at 0906-351-9620. So our topic for today is about emerging technologies for mental health, the strengths and pitfalls of using technologies for mental health. In this webinar, we're going to, Dr. Del Castillo will, be, will update us on the current, current and emerging technologies addressing mental health problems in terms of awareness, wellness, <coughs> diagnosis, assessment, and treatments. We will also discuss to us the benefits, challenges, and ethical considerations of using these technologies for mental health. And lastly, to encourage tech startups, psychologists, psychiatrists, advocates to think of technologies for mental health. Our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Ron Dr. Ronald Castillo is an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Administration and as well as Clinical Psychology and Behavioral Sciences at UP Manila. He has a doctorate degree in Clinical psycho Psychology from a joint program between Palo Alto University and Stanford University School of Medicine. He completed his clinical residency at Harvard Medical School in a postdoctoral fellowship at Tufts University. Dr. Del Castillo also holds a Master in Public Health from the University of California, Los Angeles. He is the principal investigator of a national study on mental health among university students and the project leader of another national study on non-communicable diseases and primary care. He is originally from Iloilo and after 24 years in the U.S., Dr. Del Castillo returned to the Philippines through the UP's Balik PhD program. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Dr. Ronald Del Castillo. Hello, Dr. Ronald. Hello. I hope there, you can hear me. Can... Yes, Doc. Loud and clear. Okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, Doc. <laughs> so I'm shifting now the presentation, Doc, to your laptop. Wait. Okay, um, I'll so make you, you right. the presentation, right. presenter for tonight. Okay. Thank you. Questions. And then later, Dr. Castillo, after, after the webinar, We'll try to answer your questions. I'm hey, sorry, hold uh, on. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's okay, sir. All right, can you do that again? I'm sorry. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Wait, what do you see? I'm sorry. Um, I think I, uh, all right. Uh, the, the webinar, Emerging Technologies for Mental Health. Okay, do, do, so you see my screen? Yes, sir. So should okay. I... Okay, all right, I'm sorry. All right, so that's okay, sir. Oh, no, no, I, want, I just um, want to I make sure that I... Request. Request. Sorry, sorry. Okay. All right, I'm sending you another request. Okay. Okay. How's that? 
Um, I can see your screen, sir. Ah, uh, alright. I'm able to see your ano na po, your presentation. Na. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Dr. Shall I get started? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, uh, hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. At first, I want to uh, say thank you to uh, Mental Health PH for inviting me. I'm I'm quite excited to. Um, to take part in these things because um, I'm glad to see mental health uh, really be part of the health agenda and 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 that's really because in large part to to youth to young people like you uh, including Roy and and his group so thank you I what I want to do to illustrate emerging technologies for mental health is to tell you a story so uh, let me introduce you to Carlos and um, Carlos is a likable, intelligent, 22-year-old medical student. And he has an on-again, off-again relationship with Stacy, another medical student. And right now, they are taking, quote-unquote, time off from each other. And Carlos says that they are too busy with medical school. And this is what he attributes the on-again, off-again. Uh, in their relationship. And Carlos also says that he has a kind of a crush on Brian, a friend he has had since college, who is also in the same medical school. And Carlos spends more time uh, with Brian than he does with Stacy. And Carlos says that Brian is straight, but wonders if Brian might feel the same way uh, towards him. Now, Carlos is the eldest of three siblings. His two younger brother and sister are both in college. He describes his mother as a hardworking pediatrician and describes their relationship as okay. And when asked to elaborate what okay means, Carlos says, my mother has always worked very hard and has made sacrifices for me and my brother and sister but I wouldn't say we're close. We occasionally talk, but she doesn't really know much about me. Carlos describes her as caring, but you can see in her face that she is struggling on the inside. Carlos says that his father is an OFW seaman. He says that his father has been abroad for the better part of the last 20 years. Carlos see, sees his father in the same way as he sees his mother. Carlos uh, seems to appreciate, it takes pride even, in how his father had worked hard and provided him for his siblings. And Carlos says that his family would not have been able to afford college or medical school without the sacrifices of his parents, especially his father. However, he also describes his relationship with his father as not so close and describes him as a stranger. He says, I'm thankful and all, but sometimes you want your father more than the Balik Bayan box. Carlos says that he's doing all right and surviving with medical school. He says that his heart is in it and sees himself, you know, in the long term as a physician. However, he seems to be struggling and has come to therapy for advice. And he has had difficulty sleeping in the last few weeks. He says that it's hard for him to fall asleep, to stay asleep. He says that he is eating okay, but overall he has limited appetite. He has noticed any, he has not noticed any significant changes in his weight. He describes his mood as stress, reporting some tension in his body, primarily his back, you know, and his shoulders. He says that he grinds his teeth at night. He says that sometimes he feels blah. And when asked to describe what blah means, he says, I kind of feel empty or numb. I don't know if I feel sad, but I definitely don't feel happy. Carlos's first encounter with modern mental health care begins like any other encounter for young people like him, perhaps like you. He googled his symptoms, watched YouTube, and checked the Facebook profiles of potential psychiatrists and other mental health professionals in the area. His Google search alone Yield, mil yields millions of, uh, of results. And he says that he has spent countless hours checking symptoms and watching videos. And the list of possible medical explanations seems endless, but his search seems to have directed him to possible depression and anxiety. 
he does his best, you know, to filter the seemingly boundless sources of information, being careful to look to more reliable uh, searches and to ignore questionable ones, as you, I'm sure you do this, right? He sees endless possible medical explanation for his low mood and anxiety, but he also feels validated now when he finds articles, including research journals, as well as popular media articles, you know, like a Oh, I don't know, like a Huffington Post or a Rappler or something or a, a, a newspaper or something. He feels validated in how stress levels are higher among medical students compared to the general population. So he comes across a TED talk on stress among medical students, and this gives him a sense of reassurance and hope. Equally overwhelming are the countless possible remedies for his sense of emptiness and worries. And like other youth, he is active in social media. However, more recently, his social media activity has focused more on his experience of possible depression or anxiety. He joins a Facebook group related to depression and another Facebook group related to anxiety. Through a number of web interaction, he becomes more and more convinced that he has depression and anxiety. And based on recommendations by peers through social media, and his own friends messaging him on Facebook Messenger, on his iMessage, on his phone, as well as his WhatsApp and Viber accounts, Carlos takes concrete steps to manage his depressive and anxiety symptoms in his own. Notice he has yet to see a mental health worker or a physician face to face. He takes an online screening tool for depression and anxiety. And though he is cautioned by the website that only a clinical visit would determine an actual diagnosis, he receives significant scores on the online screening tool. Carlos is more convinced than ever that he has some kind of depression and anxiety. So he downloads an app on his phone that would track the quantity and quality of his sleep says he says that since he sleeps with his phone anyway like most of you do i do it was an easy way to manage his sleeping patterns right so the app includes recommendations on how to improve his sleep including having a nightly routine regularly sleeping and waking in specific times blah 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 he also downloads an exercise app Carlos says that he does not have time to go to the gym because of medical school, so he doesn't have time, but, and also gym memberships are expensive anyway. So he downloads an app that has pictures as well as videos of exercises he can do at home. Right? The, the app allows him to track his desired workout goals. He also downloads a meditation app. He's new to meditation, and the app has simple audio instructions with which he can build his meditation practice. So he uses the app in the morning and starts with three minutes, then he builds to five minutes, and he says now that he can do 10 minutes a day. He says he wishes to meditate for up to 30 minutes a day. All the, all the apps Carlos has downloaded onto his phone are free, and all these apps are in sync with his Fitbit. Three months since he downloaded these apps, he reports that his symptoms seems to be improving. However, he wonders he might be appropriate for a psychiatric medication. So naturally, what does he do? He Googles it. He watches YouTube videos and the benefits and risks of psychotropic medication. He asks peers on Facebook about their experience of taking medication. He makes an appointment to see the physician at the University Health Service. He logs on to the online patient portal, sets up an appointment, and writes a brief description of his concerns. This message will be seen by the charge nurse and the physician on duty. He receives an automatic reply, thank you for your message. If this is an emergency, please call the emergency service or go to the nearest ER, blah, blah. And just before his appointment to the health service, he gets an email from the University Health Service instructing him to complete an online interactive depression and anxiety self-assessment tool through the online patient portal. The results will be shared with the physician, nurse, and Carlos. And the email also includes links to various carefully vetted websites on mental health. The online self-assessment tool also allows Carlos to include 
attachments just like any other email. So Carlos opens up the apps he has downloaded, the apps on sleep, on exercise, and on meditation. And since then, he has also downloaded apps on eating habits and a self-assessment tool that tracks his overall symptoms. He downloads all the progress reports from these apps and sends them as attachments to the physician and nurse. He also sends a copy of a video from his Instagram feed. He wonders if the physician or nurse at Instagram, why? Well, he has the name and the address and the phone number of their profiles anyway on the health service websites. But since that's too much work, he decides to download the video from his own Instagram and includes that as an attachment. Now, why include a video? The video was taken by a friend during an impromptu party by his classmates. They had just finished their last medical school exam for the first semester. And everyone was in a, a very happy mood, celebratory mood. However, as shown in the video, which is what Carlos is trying to share, his facial expression is visibly different from other people, from, other, from his peers. So his face seems sullen. He appears quiet and by himself. He looks alone, even though he's surrounded by friends and classmates. He decides to share this video to show the physician how different he seems to have become over these months. Two weeks later, he has an appointment at the health service. He goes to that appointment. He has a face-to-face -face meeting. That face-to-face -face meeting is the first encounter he has with the traditional healthcare system since he first began to look at his symptoms on Google almost eight months earlier. Now, what I have just sort of told you is barely a scratch on the surface of this new frontier that technology has opened up for mental health support. Smartphones, tablets, social media, websites, and other emerging technologies have really upended the traditional model of mental health care. And these emerging technologies um, not only have upended um, in the ways in which we conduct intervention, you know, such as therapy or medication, but have also upended the ways in which we do education or training as well as research related to mental health. So as you all very well know, technology these days is always evolving. In fact, by the time I'm done talking in 20 minutes, someone somewhere has already developed something else new. But one thing is clear, the pace of technology development far outpaces the pace of the scientific community's ability to investigate the efficacy cost effectiveness and safety of these emerging technologies. So an important question for us to consider, I think, is where has the significant impact been of emerging technologies in mental health? On health outcomes or on health care delivery? The emerging technologies in mental health might fall into several categories. And the, and the categories that I'm going to describe to you is basically what is the objective of the, de, of the technology itself. And what I will describe here are emerging technologies, um, uh, emerging technologies that have been used or evaluated in low and middle income countries. So the first group of emerging technologies is technology for supporting clinical care and educating health workers. And a classic example of this is something you might be familiar uh, with, and that is telepsychiatry, using online video conferencing. And telepsychiatry is actually quite promising. There's research to suggest, and remember, I'm talking about research in low and middle income countries. There's research to suggest that follow-up visits through online video conferencing for people with depression had similar clinical outcomes as standard face-to-face -face, uh, treatment. Also, telepsychiatry can help physicians remotely collaborate uh, with, uh, with mental health profession, uh, professionals, which contributes to health outcomes for people with depression and other mental health problems. So think of the possibilities there, right? So, you don't have to physically come into my office, even if you need something simple as a referral, we can do that through video conferencing, right? I evaluate you, then I refer you. It's very simple. So even something simple as asynchronous, and asynchronous is a fancy word for a store and forward kind of telepsychiatry. And an example of that is where I send you a message, like an email, and remind you of when your appointment is, give you reliable links to mental health information or other similar topics. 
So when asynchronous te telepsychiatry supplements primary care visits, it has shown to be effective in reducing depression symptoms as well as other mental health concerns. Now, the, the question, of course, naturally for us, especially here in the Philippines, is how is telepsychiatry realistic in low and middle income countries? It turns out, the bad news, my friends, is it's not really realistic. It's promising, but still has a very long way to go. Why? Because you still need a mental health professional to be on the other end of the video conferencing call. So in some instances, in order to protect your privacy and confidentiality also, you still need a brick and mortar space to house not only the equipment, but the mental health professional during the session. Right. So in light of the fact that, our, that there are very few, uh, as you all very well know, very few mental health professionals in low and middle income countries like the Philippines, I am not so sure if, if telepsychiatry is the way to go at this time. Now, another example of this emerging technology for supporting clinical care is virtual reality. And VR has been around since the 1960s. Uh, when MIT first developed it. And the principle of VR has been similar uh, since then, except that now it is extremely more sophisticated. And we use VR to create a simulated environment for people with mental health problems, wherein putting them in the real world is not safe or impractical. For example, um, VR has been used with patients who have psychotic disorders, including schizophrenia. And people with schizophrenia often have hallucinations. And the most common of these is auditory hallucinations, essentially people telling you, know, uh, telling you what to do, to hurt yourself, hurt other people, um, telling you, uh, insulting you. Uh, auditory hallucinations are the most common kinds of hallucinations. And since we cannot possibly simulate an auditory hallucination in the real world, we use VR, wherein the patient wears the, the VR device, uh, as you can see here in the picture. It's like a helmet or a mask. And, and they practice how to manage hearing voices. And the University of California, Davis, is doing great work on this. It's a collaboration. They have a center on, on virtual reality. Um, it's a collaboration between the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the School of Medicine there. And, and this virtual reality environment allows patients to manage their symptoms in a safe environment. So, for example, you know, if you're psychotic, right, what do you do when you hear voices? What do you do when you're watching TV and you think the TV is talking back to you? Virtual reality here it enables you to do that. And, and not only is it great for the patient, it's also great for, for uh, health workers, especially the medical students. This virtual reality environment here at the University of California, Davis, is used by medical students to improve their understanding of auditory and visual hallucinations experienced by their patients. And VR actually has been used to manage other kinds of mental health issues, including PTSD, phobia, social anxiety, and many other kinds of mental health problems. So, for instance, um, virtual reality has been quite effective uh, among uh, veterans, at least in the U.S., uh, because the Veterans Affairs Administration in the U.S. used virtual reality for some of their mental health treatment for PTSD among soldiers, especially after they've gotten back uh, from, from the battlefield. So obviously, we, we cannot simulate a battlefield, right? It's neither practical nor safe. But how do we simulate that environment such that the patient, the soldier in this case, can still benefit? We do that through virtual reality, right? An emerging technology can also support education of health workers. I already mentioned that virtual reality is used to train medical students, right? Another example of that is online education. And an example of online education is online peer-to-peer -peer learning. And what that is, is essentially where a student of psychology or psychiatry is partnered with a student of psychology or psychiatry in another country. And another example of, uh, of, of online education is self-directed online education. Instead of you sort of our usual seminar workshop, right, where we come in in a really cold conference room all day, right? Healthcare workers can learn about mental health issues or topics on their own time, right, through an online portal. 
Now, the biggest challenge for these kinds of online based education, as you might imagine, like here in the Philippines, is the demand for strong internet connection, which, as you know, especially in the Philippines, is either very lacking or quite expensive. So that's the first group. The second group of emerging technologies are mobile based or web based tools for facilitating diagnosis and detection of mental disorders. And this is what Carlos was doing earlier, the online self-assessment tool to screen for depression and anxiety. So these tools can be mobile, as in the apps on your phone, or can be web-based, as in specific websites or text message screening tools. Now, they have been shown to be effective in diagnosing depression and other common mental health problems, and actually just as effective as face-to-face -face clinical encounters. So the great advantage of these mobile and web-based tools, as you might imagine, is not only are they simple to use, but also enable us to reach geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas without having to use a mental health expert. Right? We can use a non-medical health worker to do the screening for us. Right. That's the second group, the mobile and web-based. The third group, the last group I want to mention is the group of technologies promoting treatment adherence and support recovery. And we can do this through text messaging and online programs, right? So an example of this is, is there has been randomized clinical trials where text messaging support as well as telephone support actually uh, improved medication adherence, prevented relapse, and improved social functioning and promoted attendance of clinical appointments. And these kinds of text messaging and telephone support have also shown to reduce depression and burden among family members or carers, you know, their loved ones, right? And it's something as simple as an automated uh, uh, text message telling you what time your appointment is, all right? Or reminding you when your appointment is, reminding you of taking your medication, right? It's almost like a behavioral reinforcement, right? Another example of this kind of emerging technology is online programs. But this case, so for example, you see me for therapy today, but then I'm not able to see you for another two or three weeks because of already scheduled travels, right? So what can you do to manage your symptoms between now and our next therapy session, which is going to be two or three weeks from now? I can recommend online-based programs where you can self-monitor your mood and where you can do cognitive behavioral therapy exercises. And, and you can go beyond that as well. You can sort of, just like Carlos did earlier, you can sort of get together the, progr the progress reports of your, of your online-based uh, program exercises, and then you could send them to me. And I, can, if we could, I could remotely evaluate your progress without having to, to come to the office. And so just like text messaging, and, and telephone support, online-based programs have been shown to be effective for improving treatment, adherence, for staying in care, for reducing symptoms, and for promoting overall mental well-being. These are just some of the examples of, of, of emerging um, uh, technologies in mental health. And we can see the advantages already, right? And I just want to cover some of these. One, of course, is convenience. Right? Treatment can take place anytime, anywhere, at home, in the middle of the night, on a bus, on your way to work, in a jeepney, it doesn't matter. It may be ideal for those who have trouble with in-person appointments. Another is anonymity, right? Clients can, patients can seek treatment without involving other people, right? An introduction to care, technology may be a first good step for those who have avoided mental health care, right? For some people, it's too much it's too threatening, right? It's, it's impractical either because I'm too far from you or it's too threatening. It's I'm not emotionally, cognitively ready yet to go to the office face to face. However, I might be ready to do a virtual therapy. So it's a great way to introduce people to the mental health care system. It could lower costs. Some apps are free. Many apps are actually free and cost less for sure than traditional care. Another is we can serve more people, I mentioned earlier, right? Geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, right? And we could also serve uh, more people, especially in times of sudden need, right? Like a disaster, right? Or, or, um, or a terror attack, for instance. Another is interest. This is, uh, 
technology is very appealing to some uh, to some groups uh, in our communities, especially young people. Right? You might be more interested in doing therapy and might be more open to it if it's uh, if it's video conferencing as opposed to coming to my office. Another I mentioned earlier, 24-hour service. Right? That's part of the convenience. Another is consistency. Right? No, no two therapists are alike. Right? The treatment might be somewhat the same, but the delivery of that treatment is different because each therapist or psychiatrist or psychologist or whoever is different because they're a different person. However, technology can sort of cut that because technology can offer the same treatment program to all users. And lastly, an advantage is support. It can complement traditional therapy by extending an in-person session reinforcing new skills and providing support and, mon and monitoring. This is what I mentioned earlier about online or web-based programs while I'm away, right? While I'm traveling, you can go to that link and, and, and monitor your progress. Now, however, these emerging technologies raise several concerns. I already mentioned earlier, right, the pace of developing these, cap uh, these technologies far outpaces the scientific um, uh, community's ability, right, to really evaluate their effectiveness. So here are some of the issues. One, of course, is effectiveness, right? The biggest concern with these emerging technologies is obtaining the scientific evidence that they work and that they work as well. This is very important. Not only they work, but do they work better or just as well as traditional therapy? For whom and for what? Another concern is understanding if apps work for all people and for all mental health conditions. Another is guidance. There's no industry-wide standards to help consumers know if an app or, or a mobile technology is proven effective. Privacy is an issue, right? Very sensitive personal information can be stored in an app, right? Regulation, there's limited, if any, regulation. And the question of who will or should regulate mental health technology and the data it generates as a consequence. And overselling. There's some concern that if an app or program promises more than it delivers, consumers may turn away from it, from more effective therapies. And this gets me to something that I think we should talk about before I end, and especially if you're someone who wants to develop these kinds of technologies. Now, technologies make a promise, right, that they would make the world better, right, that they would make our lives better. Now, if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend that you, that you read this New York Times articles from last year. Uh, it's by Alison Arif, and it's called Solving All the Wrong Problems. And here are some of the apps and digital services she wonders about. An app that analyzes the quality of your French kissing. An app to locate rentable yachts. An app that lets us brew our coffee from anywhere. A sensor placed in your child's diaper that sends you an alert when the diaper needs changing. An app that imparts wisdom. Well, that must be a, one hell of an app. Now, the central thesis of her article, are they really solving a problem? She writes, as one colleague in tech explained to me recently, for most people working on such projects, the goal is basically to provide for themselves everything that their mothers no longer do. Now, it's a joke, obviously, sort of. But her point here is that technology seems to be making promises, but do not really deliver that promise. So, for instance, one of the, the, the sexy word right now, the, the sort of the word du jour, is hack, right? Hack, H-A-C-K, which means to cut or to break. Now, incidentally, a reef sort of makes pun of that, a fun of that word, because hack is also actually a prison slang for horses, we can guess what the A there starts with, and carrying keys, right? So she's poking fun of sort of the hack this, hack that. So she asks, are we fixing the right things? Are we breaking the wrong ones? And is it necessary to start from scratch every time? So what is missing for a reef is empathy, humility, compassion, and conscience. So if you are one to innovate and contribute to the emerging technologies of mental health, you have to ask yourself, are you innovating for the sake of innovation 
or are you innovating to actually improve lives? So, finally, I want to provide some recommendations on how you can filter through mobile apps, and I specifically focus on mobile apps. I know I, I've mentioned other kinds of, uh, of emerging technologies, such as virtual reality and telepsychiatry, but I wanted to focus on mobile apps because these are the kinds of mental health emerging technologies that I suspect most of you will likely encounter. So what do you do? And there are no review boards, no checklists, no widely accepted rules for choosing an app. And most apps do not have peer-reviewed research to support their claims. And it is unlikely that every mental health app will go through some kind of randomized controlled trial, right? So one reason is that testing is very slow, as I mentioned earlier. So here are some suggestions for finding an app that may work for you. I recommend that you ask a trusted healthcare provider for a recommendation. Check to see if the app offers recommendation for what to do if symptoms get worse or if there is a psychiatric, uh, psychiatric emergency. Decide if you want an app that is completely automated or an app that offers opportunities for contact with a trained person. Right, so more than likely, especially here in the Philippines, you're, you're gonna want an app that's completely automated because the other option where there's sort of uh, you do an automation, but also an opportunity to contact an actual person. That's going to be very unlikely here in the Philippines. Another is you want to search for information on the app developer it's, uh, itself. Can you find helpful information about the credentials of the people who develop the app? And that's very important. Another, you want to be aware of misleading logos. And I'm going to give you an example, for instance, uh, in the U.S., the National Institute of Mental Health does not endorse any apps, nor does it develop any apps related to mental health. However, some developers have used, illegally, the NIMH logo to market their products. Ah. So obviously that's an issue. Another is you want to look at the PubMed uh, databases. Uh, they might contain articles in a wide range of topics that uh, related to, to mobile technology and mental health. If there's no information about a particular app, what you want to do then is to check to see if the treatment the app is purporting to, to, uh, to use is, uh, has been researched. Uh, for example, research has shown that uh, internet-based cognitive behavior therapy is as effective as conventional cognitive behavioral therapy for disorders such as depression, anxiety, social phobia, and panic disorder. So, right, so if there's no information on the app, you find information on the therapy that the app is trying to deliver to you. And lastly, you want to try it, obviously. If you're interested in the app, right, test it for a few days and decide if it's easy to use, it holds your attention, and if you want to continue using it, right? An app is only effective if you keep using it for weeks and for months, right? You want to try it, right? And if you don't like it, you all you gotta do is press very hard on it and then right and it'll shake and then it'll come out the little X will come out in the corner and all you gotta do is press that little X as long as you try it right and we can see why that's sort of hard to do in traditional therapy right it's hard to get rid of your psychologist it's hard to get rid of your psychiatrist right you can't just push a button to get rid of them but for this for a mobile app try it if you don't like it get rid of it right so Finally, so we clearly we have made great, great strides in emerging technologies for mental health. However, it remains to be clear, it remains to be seen how effective these kinds of technologies really are. And thank you very much for listening. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ronald de Castillo, for that very elaborative presentation. Sure. Um, we sure. have a lot of questions right now from our participants. Sure. Um, allow sure, me sure. to read. All right, allow me to read some of the questions. Okay. Okay. So we have a question from Miss Elaine Wilson. Um, her question okay. is: Is emerging technology more beneficial for the younger group than the older group or elders? Um. I, well, yes and no in terms of the service delivery part. Uh, potentially right. in terms of the health outcomes, I'm not so sure. But the delivery part, yes, I mean, that makes sense, right? Because young people are just more tech savvy, so I can see why. <laughs> but the issue there is not because of the technology. The issue there is because older people just haven't learned. So if you teach them, 
I'm sure they're going to learn in the same way that young people learn how to use Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Uh, for young people, yes. Yeah. So there would be a difference, but it's, it's the difference is in the service delivery, not necessarily on the health outcome. All right. I hope that answered your question, Ms. Elaine. Um, so we have another question, sir. I may, I'll call in uh, Mr. Raymond John Ang. Uh, sure, sure. All right. Mr. Raymond, uh, right. and so your microphone is already on. You can ask questions to Dr. Del Castillo. Hi, Dr. Del Castillo. Oh, this is Raymond. Hi, hi, yes. Hi. Oh, I'd yes. like to ask because uh, here in the States, uh, HIPAA is really a, a big issue. So there are lots yeah. of applications, mobile applications. Uh, I'd just like to sure, ask, sir. are users uh, expected to use apps or mobile uh, or web applications that are HIPAA compliant or, or they can choose whichever uh, applications they want because uh, uh, the application could have uh, a user interface or a workflow that adheres to HIPAA but one of the aspects of HIPAA is that uh, the servers where the application are installed should have a business associate agreement so if uh, I'm a developer right, right, right. and I don't have my own servers I would be renting servers, and those uh, provisioning servers should have business uh, uh, associated agreement. Right, that's right. That's so right. how that's can right. users? Exactly. That's a good. That's a good point. That, that's a good point. Yes. So yes, if you're using the technology, right, whether it be online based, whether web based, like a uh, like the online portal that I was describing earlier, uh, you're of course yes, you have to have to be compliant with any existing uh, rules and regulations, especially. Uh, with regards to privacy and confidentiality, because the, the, the issue of privacy and confidentiality doesn't change. It's just that your delivery of the healthcare service changes, right? So regardless of the delivery, you still have to be compliant. But remember, when I'm talking about mobile technology, especially the apps, the, the, the developers would argue that they're not delivering a kind of healthcare service, right? They're delivering a, a something, but they wouldn't call it a healthcare service, and therefore, they are not necessarily required, for better or for worse, they're not required to follow certain kinds of rules and regulations, right? So for instance, if I, if I, say, if I say that, oh, this is an app that uh, is about meditation, uh, it's an app uh, about tracking uh, uh, your depression symptoms, uh, I, I would, I, I would uh, be doubtful if they're required to follow certain kinds of rules and regulations regarding privacy and confidentiality, because that's not what they're doing. Okay. That makes sense. So, so if they yeah. are not delivering service, but if they are storing information that might be health related, would that mean? Yeah, that no, yeah, uh, well, yeah, yes, that's true. But uh, remember, the uh, storing health information is not necessarily is not necess storing health information in itself does not necessarily mean you have to be HIPAA compliant. Th there must okay. be a relationship between you and the healthcare deliverer in a sense that. You're expecting something from them, and they're expecting some view, something from you. In which case, you have to keep some their health pri uh, data private and confidential to a degree. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is like just like any other app you download, right? Divide. You have to agree to things that nobody reads, right? You have to agree in order to download the app, right? So okay. it's just like that, and you agree to uh, to agree to to store your whatever your depression symptoms, your sleep patterns, or whatever. But it's it to me. I wouldn't say that that's a health record because that's not what's happening in terms of healthcare delivery. Okay, so in order for us to have uh, to ensure HIPAA compliance, there should be like a, a provider, a client relationship first, right? And not yes, necessarily exactly, just, okay, exactly, okay, okay, right, exactly. Yes, that's right, exactly. Okay, exactly. that's a good point. Thanks, doctor. All right. Okay, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Raymond. Hey, sir, Re sir Raymond. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, all right, another question po, Dr. Del Castillo from Ms. Isabel Esquera. Yeah, yeah. um, how can uh -huh. self-directed online education go towards accurate information as many people use it to help detect mental health problems? A problem can be self-diagnosis, which is very dangerous, is not officially diagnosed by a mental health professional. Self-diagnosed people tend to use their diagnosis to appear as cool with the romanticizing of mental right, illness. Right. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I, yeah, no, I agree with you, and that's part of the, uh, you know, that's really part of the challenge of these kinds of emerging technologies because it, it makes it makes information so accessible that you sort of end up 
self-diagnosing yourself, right? Sort of yes. checking your checking your checking your symptoms. And that, that that and that's not true for mental health. That's not only true for mental health. That's true for any kind of illness that we're sort of suspicious about, right? Oh, is this you know, is this cancer? Is this whatever? Like we end up sort of freaking out and, and trying to figure out what it is that we have, right? And and then that's true for mental health as well. However, I think you know, there there's no easy answer to that because information is so available so quickly and so and it's so accessible that I have a hard time imagining how to stop people from 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 self you know what I mean from not diagnosing exactly. themselves. Right. At the end of the day, if you want an actual treatment, right? If you want like a like an actual medication or or, or a therapy session, then for sure you're gonna need to actually be diagnosed by an actual person or at least a person and then a reliable source of technology, right? Um, yeah. If you self-diagnose, that's probably just sort of maybe for your own benefit, which is fine. That might get you some comfort, but in the long term, uh, that's not going to be sufficient. Yeah, to to really manage whatever it is you're going through. All right. So although we have uh, we have online self-directed on education or. We can we can check information online. We should always we should still always um, consult or have yourself diagnosed with a professional. Uh, yes. yes, absolutely, absolutely. Right. Yes, yes. You know. um, here's um, I think we can still accommodate two more questions though, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Right. I have my wine. It's all good. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you have your wine. <laughs> uh, so you said a question from um, Dr. Eve Catalbas, classmate of mine in MS Health Informatics. Um, question is, how okay. do you think we can encourage mental health practitioners to embrace these new technologies? Patients may be more ready yeah. than the practitioners, and that still causes a supply-demand imbalance. Sure, sure. Absolutely. No, absolutely. No, that's an, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and I think that's true for, for, many, uh, for many kinds of technologies, whether it be uh, uh, digital or otherwise. I, I think one... I think one emerging technologies should be part of your basic education if you want to if you're learning something right so meaning that if you are in training in psychiatry part of your training in psychiatry should be emerging technology right that should be part of your of your clinical training if anything emerging technologies of any kind should be part of your education especially if you're going to medical school or nursing or whatever Right, because what we're talking about is the mode of delivery, right? So the mode of delivery can be face to face, which is n like 99% of delivery, or it could be this. So this emerging technology part should be part of your education as a health worker, right? All right. So, um, so, so that's one. I think that's one. Um, and and number two, I think uh, encouraging health workers, showing them evidence that in fact. The, the patients, our clients, however you want to call them, are interested in, in these kinds of technologies. Um, we can talk about cost effectiveness as well, right? Um, another I, 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 I would also uh, recommend is to really get people to really study it, right? I know this is exciting because it's digital, it's technology, what, 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 you know, it's, it's exciting, it's it's you know we're all very tech savvy and all that but at the end of the day nobody really knows if they work right yeah. nobody yes. does and so i think There's another way to really ex <laughs> the really way, another way to excite people is to get them to do research in these kinds of things so i imagine that our young people today who are in med school are in fact very excited to to yeah. deliver these kinds of things so use that enthusiasm and channel that through research, not only through clinical care. And I think those will be some ways to really get people excited about it. Yes. All right. So um, there's another question, sir. Medyo, um, medyo iba. <laughs> um, sure. so, wait, sorry. How does insurance coverage and reimbursement work for online therapy? This is a question from Greg Feliz. Marino po ba yun uh, yes, okay. Right yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I don't think that's... Well, in, well, insurance coverage of mental health problems is very is, is essentially uh, non-existent here in the Philippines. Uh, but from uh, but, but but before I comment on that, in in places that there are health insurance, that's already been worked out. And as a matter of fact, large health insurance companies, uh, especially um, uh, HMOs, right, uh, 
uh, health management organization, healthcare management organizations in the U.S. That's part of their healthcare insurance package for therapy. Mm -hmm. That it's not only face to face, but it's also how many sessions do you have for um, for for online kind online. of uh, of therapy, whether it be video conferencing. So so it's already part of the package, right? And in some instances, they you get charged uh, less. Right, because it's not as expensive, which is true. Uh, face to face yes. therapy is quite expensive, right? So yeah. the insurance coverage might cover it, which is great, but, but then it also ends up being also lower premium for you, right? Because the face to face, I mean, the, the video conferencing is, is cheaper. Or so, it's less expensive. again, I know, yes, exactly, exactly. Remember, the way, for me, the easy way to think about this is the health is the delivery of the service itself. Not because the treatment is the same, if, if, that, if you can believe that, right? The treatment, the actual treatment, right, if you can, uh, is the same, except the delivery of the treatment is the thing that's different, right? So, so right. for me, the mode of delivery is the one that's really changing, especially with emerging technologies. And many mm -hmm. insurance companies, including the U.S., have really welcomed that, really welcomed that change here. I'm not aware of any in the Philippines. I, I don't know of any health insurance that would cover one <laughs> mental health problems at all. <laughs> uh, and then, but number two, uh, like uh, and number two, just the technology based kind of, of mental health care. All right. In relation, I think somehow if it's available in the Philippines, um, I think she's interested because you sh you showed a video of the VR, sir. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, Patricia yeah. Ern is asking, is VR available as treatment or therapy rehab here in the Philippines? And if available, uh, no, so it's not. It's not it, yeah, it, uh, it's, uh, I'm not aware of any here, any kind right. of VR, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. of any kind, whether it be mental health or otherwise. I, I'm not, a, I'm personally, I'm not. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm someone in the, in uh, some of the attendees might be able to enlighten mm. us, but I, I'm not aware of any. Um, the, the picture that I showed you actually is from um, in the UK where they do these kinds of things. Uh, th that was actually a, a screenshot uh, of, of a woman there. She, right, she's wearing the she's wearing the the, the, the VR uh, technology, and what she's seeing. I didn't show this to you, but what she's seeing is she has social phobia, especially in public transportation. So what she's looking at is she's in a train with a bunch of people and she imagines being stared at. So what do you do, right? So that's how we're simulating her anxiety, right? And helping her then to manage her social phobia. Very interesting. I hope magkakaroon na rin tayo ng VR dito sa Philippines soon. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But, but remember, yeah. one of the thing, remember, one of the things that, uh, if I can just say, uh, one last thing is, uh, remember, that, that what's different is the, del is the delivery, not the actual uh, treatment. So what we need, yes. if the message here, is what we need is the treatment. We first need the treatment before we can deliver it, right? So um, to my knowledge, not many people know how to do cognitive behavioral therapy or any other kind of therapy, right? So we need to train people yeah. first, we need a health worker first, and then we can think about how to deliver it. How to deliver it. <laughs> right? Or else, <laughs> yeah, or else then we have nothing to deliver. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly. Yes. yes. Right. So, Rud, um, are you aware of this issue, Ms. Caitlin Keith Shera raised? To Dr. Del Castillo, why do you think the NCMH does not agree with app-based mental health mental health care services? Would you like to comment on that, book? I, I think it's because um, well, well, not to put blame on it. I, I think it's because of. of um, I don't think they're not interested. I, I do think that it's hard to be interested in something like that when you have other problems. You know what yeah. I mean? Like the, the, the National Center has other issues that it needs to be preoccupied with, right? It, there's too many people in there, right? Uh, there's not enough workers, right? There's not enough resources to meet basic needs, right? So that for me, the message, one of the important messages for us tonight, I hope, is that these emerging technologies work. But remember, they work in many environments and communities because their basic needs have already been met. Right? So it's exciting to have virtual reality because we've met the basic needs. Now we can do the exciting stuff, right? the virtual reality or whatever. Right? But that's hard to do if you don't have the basic stuff to begin with. Mm. Right? And I think 
the National Center is struggling there for a lot of reasons, not to be blamed to the National Center, right? There's just not, right. it's not a lot of the, you know, the budget and all of that stuff, the basic <laughs> stuff, right? If we can get taken care of that, then maybe they might be open to more, to more, no, to more advanced technologies of, 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 of the, uh, delivering uh, mental health services. Yes. Also, I hope after this webinar, we could encourage people all over the world or uh, first in the Philippines to think of technologies that could um, help for mental health so that somehow we can propose mm. it to the NCMH or get funding from DOH and other. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sir, uh, the last yeah. two questions. Uh, Mr. Sure. Michael Arpas, is there any telehealth law in the Philippines? I got disconnected in the middle of the discussion. <laughs> a, a telehealth law? Oh, that's a good question. And, you know, to be honest, I don't know. There's no telehealth, there's no mental health specific telehealth call. Right? Right? Yes. If there's no telehealth call, they can't possibly have mental health specific to telehealth. So, um, I, I, I honestly, I'm not aware of any. Are are you? Are, are, I don't know. All right, so I think I, I can think answer so. the question too. Um, as yeah. MS Health and Paramedics, as far as I know, hindi pa po napasa yung bill for the yeah. telehealth law. Yeah. So okay. nasa telehealth bill yes, palang po. Right. There are two versions of the telehealth law or bill, pero um hanggang bill palang po siya. <laughs> so wala yes. pa pong telehealth okay. law. Okay, I thought. Yes, that's right. right. That's right. I thought. So. Um, that's right. That's right. Just to I think just to cap this evening, sir, one last question from Mr. Glenn Picaro. Sure, sure. Uh, does the apps sure, sure. that can use for certain purposes is locally developed, and if not, there will be an issue about culturally related compat or compatible to the Philippines? Yes, yeah, exactly. Very good. And that's an excellent yes. point. That's an excellent point, which is all the more reason why we got to do our own stuff. Right? Because, uh, because um, yes. I mean, some technologies are easily transferable. Right? They, they really are. Um, they are easily transferable. But remember, because they, much of these mobile apps in particular have not really been tested in terms of evaluated in terms of their effectiveness, right? That gives us yes. an opportunity to, to really test their effectiveness here in, 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 our, in, uh, in our culture, right? And so, but remember, I, I, again, I cannot emphasize this enough. You, you cannot really test how something, whether or not something is effective locally Right, in terms of especially mobile apps, right? Unless you have a basic understanding of how mental health stuff works locally, right? So you can't just be developing like, oh, a, a list of depression. For instance, if you want like a technology, a mobile app to, to, to test for screening for depression, right? That seems pretty straightforward, right? That seems really, yeah. right, we develop an app, locally adapt it, maybe we'll translate it, blah, blah, blah. That seems exciting, but that's assuming that depression in the Philippines is the same as depression in the West. And research exactly. shows that it's yes. not. It <laughs> looks different here in many, in not only in the Philippines, but in many other parts of the world, which means that your mobile app must be specific to our kind of depression. Mm, right? right? Before right. you can make a list, you need to first define what depression is for us. Depression is in the and I think that's where, yeah, and I think that's where we need to first start before we get sort of too excited about what depression is in a phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, too. Thank you very much, Dr. Del Casillo, for the very engaging discussion. Sure, sure. Thank you. All right. So sure, sure, I hope. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to end this is this uh, webinar. I hope we can, I know, we can um, conduct another webinar next time for mental health. Also, you can contact us at mentalhealthph.org or email us at mentalhealthph at gmail .com. So that ends our webinar for tonight. Thank you for joining. This is our Roy Dahil Dahil from MSM, MS Health Informatics and uh, Dr. Ronald Del Castillo from the College of Public Health. Thank you and good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Ronald. Sure, sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Doc.